I, uh, I want to preface this by letting you know that when I get excited about something, I will speed talk. So I'm going to try to not warp speed through this and let you capture everything we're talking about. Um, I'm going to speak to getting things done in store and really just discuss with you, um, imagining that you're the 5% who's in store. How do you get things done? What are the operations in store that need to take place? And how do you maintain that placement that we heard Rick talk about earlier that was so difficult to uh, maintain that shelf space? So, um, you know, we're going to talk too about how to select a third party provider, but let's just have a hypothetical for a moment. You just got distribution into about 500 Walmarts as a test. You're super excited. Your product is getting ready to launch. Let's say you found an awesome marketing team that really put together this beautiful display. You're going to have um, great consumer awareness for your brand. You're just super excited. And you go into a store to check on that display, thinking that it's out on the floor, everything should be in store, and it's not there. You don't see it. Maybe it got lost in the back room. Maybe it's damaged. It's not on the floor. What do you do? All of a sudden, the disappointment sinks in. And this is where you start to realize that, that you need some help getting things done on the shelf. Someone may recommend to you third-party merchandising, and you think, well, what is third-party merchandising? What is the definition for that? So we're going to cover that today and, and discuss what is third-party merchandising? What is their role? What is the mission? keys to driving effectiveness in store, um, driving efficiencies, as well as what to look for in third-party providers specifically, and asking the right questions. Um, you've heard multiple people say asking the right questions gets you the answers you seek. Never be afraid to ask a multitude of questions. And then we'll have some time for a Q&A. All right, so what is third-party? Just-in-time labor and expertise accomplished through shared infrastructure. So I know that sounds kind of um, confusing a little bit to some of you probably. Um, third party really would handle different needs in store that um, maybe the store labor used to do. We'll get into some cycle um, definitions of that later, but specifically surge needs, promotional display placement, um, feature displays. Uh, let's say you missed uh, the mod drop and you need your item cut in for that launch. So you would have a third party go in and make that set. Um, do resets within store. Those types of things would be what you see. So store employees teaming with that brand team support, which would be your third party merchandiser, is what equals that store execution. Get to the next one eventually. <laughs> Here we go. All right, so this, this slide kind of gives you a, an overview of what that looks like. Um, routine store maintenance would be, you know, checking shelf labels, inventory, um, doing the general maintenance for, you know, facings and, and product and so forth. Surge coverage would cover um, resets, seasonal, promotional items. In the past, this is something that the retailer associates all did. That was under their job description. They would handle all of these tasks. But as store labor has decreased, we've seen an influx of that third-party merchandising. And that's where they're coming in and taking off those surge items, just really reducing the burden off of the retailers so they can focus on those important core items, which would be the maintenance, um, you know, the, the inventory, making sure that those on hands are, are as they should be and we're not noticing phantom inventory problems on a regular basis, which some of you are very familiar with, a little bit too much. Others, um, you, you'll probably learn about that soon. Um, so really just making sure that they can provide the best customer service and do what the retailer associates are supposed to focus on. This is Mary. Meet Mary. Mary represents the store associate who initially had all of those tasks. And what you may see now is as that store labor has been reduced, you're seeing more and more third party. Maybe you recognize them in a uniform. Maybe they're in plain clothes, so you don't. Um, you see the store labor being reduced with the influx of the different merchandise and companies in store to handle those needs that, that the retailer had before. Now there's a few different labor models. There's a plethora of merchandise and companies. Everyone is different. We operate on different label model, excuse me, <laughs> labor models. You heard Rick talk about crowdsourcing earlier. There's independent contractor models. There's W-2 models. You really have to sit down and make a determination in the beginning 
what are some pros and cons of each that fit or don't fit for you, and what would be your priorities in making that selection. That way you can be better informed ahead of time and ask the right questions when you come to, to reviewing different companies. All right, so what is the mission of third party? Effectively and efficiently scaling execution and expertise at the point of sale. You really need someone who um, can be effective getting into store, knowing who to speak with, can be efficient, knows how to operate in the back room. We, we know operating in Walmart is a very different beast than operating in a CVS or a different drug chain. So these are the types of things that you want to review with your merchandising companies when making that selection so you know what your options are when scaling the expertise that you need. So for all the students, we threw in a math problem. Formula for being effective. Who doesn't love word math problems? Um, your objective divided by your resources multiplied by your accountability equals effectiveness. Accountability is so critical. In any piece of service that you are getting in store, you want to hold your team accountable. From the bottom to the top, it doesn't matter. And how are you getting that accountability with your service? So looking at some different keys to driving effectiveness. Focused objectives with specific and prioritized outcomes. Very clear in the beginning, not only having communication and, and in some cases over communicating, but thinking about specific things that you would like to have in store completed, you know, whether that's a promotional display set, whether that's that cut in we talked about, or even if you just want to know what's going on with your set in store and getting a basic audit, verifying shelf labels and those types of things, have it detailed in the beginning. What are those objectives? Prioritize them, especially if you're working on a tight budget. You want to know that, that your um, objectives are being covered in a time frame. And say we run over time, we want to make sure that we have first focus. Category and brand expertise. You want someone that can get in there and knows the category, knows how it operates, and someone that can be a brand advocate for you. <laughs> Excuse me. It's also important to know different merchandising companies, different third parties, are retail-centric or supplier-centric or customer-centric, excuse me, brand-centric, knowing that um, some of them solely operate within one retailer. They have that expertise. They can get the job done in the back room with the management. They can go in and, and provide your services within that retailer, but they may not be able to scale outside of that single retailer. So in addition to that, maybe they're covering 30 objectives within that particular retailer, but you may not have that direct brand advocacy that you want to get the message across. So this is another consideration up front. Do you want someone that has the brand expertise that's passionate as you are about your new product that's launching and can grow with you and scale that across? So just again, to uh, consider the list of needs in the beginning. Knowledge of retail, retailer processes, and procedures. We talked about the back room. Knowing the, um, the personnel infrastructure, who do you need to speak with when you're in store? The processes, dealing with um, seasonal calendars when you're in store and knowing how Q4 operates versus Q1. Uh, measurable outcomes with incentives and consequences. When you're dealing with those objectives, what are your expectations at the end of your service? To know exactly what the outcome's gonna be and, and if you're going to push forward, maybe you decide that the outcome was great with this particular service of a cut-in or an audit, and you want to scale to some continuity coverage and have that particular third party monitoring your set or your product on a regular basis. Sufficient tools and resources to accomplish the objective. This is so important. I know I've said that about a few things. There are several things that are very critical. but. Sufficient tools and resources, and what I mean by that would be things like a store list. Where exactly are we going for you? Where, where do you need that service? Within what category? Do we have correct item numbers? Do we have um, a, a detailed timeline for execution? Are we aligning with particular merchandise um, that's, that's new going in on a specific date? Do we have insurance that it's going to be there on that date? What if it's delayed? Are we going to delay execution? These are all very critical details. And an additional resource that a lot of people don't think about is time, time consideration. If you're thinking about having something done in Q4 when there's chaos for that seasonal set and the resets that are taking place and all those items that are on the floor, you really need to think about 
the time execution will take during that season versus another time of year when there is increased store traffic. You might not have all of the um, store compliance that you would typically have earlier in the year if the managers are extremely busy handling other things. Time to train. What if we're scaling some large continuity for your brand if you're um, now distributed across the entire full chain? And you have some very specific requirements that require that brand advocacy training. How long is it going to take to scale up to get the team that you need in place? What type of technology that do they need to be trained on? All of these things um, coupled together. Even shipping displays into store. If you're shipping it to your third party to help out and carry that product into store, how long does it take to get from your center to theirs and then out to their people? So again, just things to consider. <laughs> Think of, um, think of your favorite recipe, your most favorite dish that you could imagine. Mine happens to be sushi, so I'm going to think of sushi. Um, a chef making that favorite dish. That, that's only going to be as great as the ingredients that the chef has given to make that for you. So think of your third party team as the chef and you as the supplier holding the grocery list. You need to make sure you have top quality stuff going into the kitchen so you get the correct meal and you get that correct third party service that you need. Okay, formula for being efficient. Frequency plus brand expertise divided by procedural consistency equals efficiencies. So the more you have a brand advocacy team in store operating for you, the more continuity you have, you develop those efficiencies, right? So let's discuss some keys to drive that. Plan jointly. So critical to team together. Especially as a new supplier, you may not know exactly how operations run in store. And it's very important to, to discuss with your merchandising partner, your third party, what, what have they experienced before? What knowledge do they have in store? And, and what are their options for getting things done? Really leverage the experience that other professionals have that you can learn from. Differentiate a retail team from brand advocacy. We talked about that a little bit earlier when you have someone that's very retail centric compared to someone that's brand centric and knowing where the focus lies. Because there are different models for each individual case and there are pros and cons to each. So it comes down to determining what's most important for you and your brand. Adopt a model that delivers the best combination of frequency, brand expertise, and procedural consistency. So again, strategizing, formulating a plan, an action plan that, that best suits your brand, pushing that so that you can increase sales. Because really, all of this planning comes down to increasing your sales, securing your placement in store. If you don't have that consumer awareness, you're not increasing the sales, then that really impacts your placement in store, your distribution levels, your placement on shelf. All of these things can be affected if you're not planning and paying attention. So you either fail to plan and plan to fail, or you make it happen the first time, because that's all you have. Initiative-based budgeting versus straight trade fund allocation. So what we mean by this is, <coughs> excuse me, if you have specific projects, say seasonal projects, where um, you know it's a quick quick display or a quick promotional feature. That would be initiative-based budgeting. So you're going to allot a very specific amount of funds for that project versus straight fund allocation where you're investing in third-party merchandising to help you on shelf continuously throughout the year. <laughs> Excuse me. So now that you know some of the benefits of having a third-party merchandiser and really the need for it, what do you look for when you're selecting a third-party provider? Accountability. We talked about the importance of accountability. I don't care what service industry you're in, what business, accountability is always important, and I don't think I've ever heard anyone disagree with that. Photo verification. Can you see the work being performed? How is that, how is that going to be shown to you? Quality control. Communication. Touched on that a few times. Asking the right questions. You can never ask too many questions. There's never a wrong question. Just ask. So what are some examples of questions that would be good to ask? Do you check objectives were executed? And how? Is this photo verification? Is this a merchandiser saying they completed it? Do you do geocoding? There are several different companies that offer different variations. It's important that you ask and you know ahead of time when making your selection. How do you ensure compliance? Do you check for quality of work? What is your quality control process? 
What happens if something doesn't pass quality control? What's the steps then? What communication can I expect? What type of reporting do I get and in what formats? Am I going to have an Excel summary? Am I going to have my own portal where I can access information? When is that information accessed? Do I have a person of contact that will be directly reaching out to me? Will that happen at the beginning of a project and at the end or throughout? All very important details because what happens if in the middle of a project you have a question or you're having a serial defect issue you realize and, and something needs to be halted? What if inventory isn't making it to the store? Lots of different variables. I think I heard someone say earlier, you need to plan for the worst, accept that, that something may happen and be cognizant that you need to have a plan in place just in case. Um, will I see pictures of all performed? This kind of stems into our quality control as well. You know, what, what type of quality of work should be expected? Will I see pictures that it's completed and that those objectives are executed? How will those be sent to me so I can see them? Is it a lump file that's going to bog down my email? Will it be in that portal or the executive summary? All things you may not have considered before, but now you know and you really should. Um, what is the best action plan for my budget? If you're not teaming with someone that will work with you and strategize against your budget, you need to work with someone else. You understand that it may not always fit within your budget. You, you may be told that maybe what you're looking for within a certain budget is unrealistic. Understand that you need to strategize with people, have proper expectations, and, and know how to plan this out together. Sped through that and caught us up on time. <laughs> I, I actually um, didn't include any quotes on here, but I, I read one earlier I think is really important um, and really applies to this. It's by um, Benjamin Dizarelli, who was a prime minister in the 1800s. But he said, um, action does not guarantee success, but you will not have success if you don't take action. And that's really important. You're not going to succeed in store if you don't take action and be at the forefront of making it happen with your brand and maintaining that presence. So... Um, feel free to contact me afterwards. You can send me an email. I've got some cards. And uh, if you want to discuss some more details, meet afterwards. I'll be happy to do so. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much.